Lord, I pray that through this time, you would help each one of us here today to learn something new about you. May you open our eyes to see what your word is saying to us. And Lord, be with each one of us, I pray. Amen. Amen. So um, this morning is our final message in the Beatitude series. And I thought it would be a good place to start if we looked back at everything that we've been hearing already. Uh, So if you've got a Bible with you, or a phone, or like Rush, you've got a Bible and a phone, um, let's turn to Matthew 5, verses 2 to 12. In my Bible, it's page 994, but that probably won't help any of you. Um, And it says this, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And it, it's amazing, really, isn't it? Because when you read that as a whole section, it, it's completely backwards. It doesn't make any sense. You read it and think, these statements that Jesus is making are completely flipped on their head from what we see in the world around us. If you pick one example and read it on its own, let's say, blessed are the hungry. Well, no, they're probably quite hungry. They're not feeling blessed at all, are they? It doesn't really seem to make any sense when you read it on its own. And it only starts to make sense when we have relationship with Jesus. This list of blessings only begins to be comprehensible when we know who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But of course, at this point in Matthew's Gospel, we don't know that yet, because that's still to come. But we do know it now. And Jesus is preaching about the new covenant, the way things are going to be. And we are now living in the good of what he has done for us. And if you're new to church this morning and you've got no idea what I'm talking about, um, let me give you a brief overview uh, of what it is. And I would encourage you to chat to someone after the service, maybe a friend or someone you know, or Craig or Russ or Peter, one of the Peters. Either one, I'm sure, would be happy to talk to you about what the Bible means. But very briefly, Jesus is the Son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary, who raised him as a son, along with her husband Joseph. When Jesus was about 30... He began his ministry, which was teaching and preaching the good news to those he met, showing the love of God to everybody. He performed miracles and signs to show that he was God. The religious leaders at the time, they didn't like it much, and they didn't believe what he said, and they tried to make his life incredibly difficult. In fact, they ended up arresting him and crucifying him on a cross as if he were a criminal. But don't worry, that wasn't the end. Jesus died on the Friday, was placed in a, st- in a tomb, but on the Sunday he rose to life and greeted his disciples. And he promised to send them his Holy Spirit, who would be with them forevermore. Jesus conquered death. He was perfectly blameless and yet willingly died on the cross. In doing so, he took on the punishment for all of us so that we can be forgiven and live in perfect unity with God. Jesus quite literally saved the world from all the bad things that we do that we call sin and gave us freedom to be in relationship with the creator of the world. So with that in mind, the Beatitudes now start to make a bit more sense. Jesus is saying that in the kingdom of God, this is what the world will be like. But does that mean that we have to wait until heaven to enjoy those blessings? No. We can live in the good of those things now, because as we see in the next chapter, in chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, Jesus teaches us how to pray. And in doing so, he uses the line, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Earth is to become like heaven. 
The life of heaven is to become the life of the world, and those blessings are to become the blessings of the world. But let's just make one small point. These statements from Jesus, they're not a list of things that we must do in order to receive these blessings. No, these blessings we receive because we are in relationship with God. We receive and embody these traits because of our relationship with Jesus and not the other way around. So now that we've done that bit, let's focus on the bit that we're actually talking about today, which is verses 10 to 12 which say, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And that sounds mildly terrifying, doesn't it? What does persecution really mean? It sounds quite scary. So the dictionary describes it as hostility and ill treatment, especially on the basis of ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation, or political beliefs, or persistent annoyance or harassment. Great. I feel blessed, don't you? (laughs) So facing persecution can be being treated with hostility for your religion. It would seem odd, then, that Jesus seems to be saying that this is a good thing because it doesn't really seem like a blessing at all. But one of my favorite things about the Beatitudes is that they all go hand in hand, because later in chapter 5, verses 43 to 45, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. So if we read that alongside the rest of the Beatitudes, we see that they all start to link. We aren't just blessed in one area. We're blessed in all areas. If we pray for those who come against us, we show them mercy. We're peacemakers. We thirst for righteousness, and so on and so on. Jesus definitely knew what he was doing. By being a part of the kingdom of God, our whole lives are flipped upside down. Don't go into the Fresh Prince rap. (laughs) And we are completely blessed in all areas as we seek to live out this calling on our lives. So let's jump back into the Old Testament. And we can see an example of persecution. You can find it in Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 28. And what happens here is that Daniel has been promoted throughout the kingdom to become one of the top officials. And he's about to be promoted again so that he's in charge of the entire area. And the other high officials and the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the councillors, they start to feel a little bit jealous. Who's this Daniel bloke? And why is he all of a sudden being put in charge of everything? We want to do that. So they come up with this crazy idea. If we get the king, his name's Darius, to decree a law that goes against the God of Daniel, we'll be able to get rid of him. So that's exactly what they do. So they go to the king and say, Oh, King Darius, aren't you amazing? Aren't you lovely? Aren't you wonderful? And he goes, Yes. As I am. They go, wouldn't it be great if you made a law that for the next 30 days, nobody can make a petition to any other man or God but you? He goes, that would be good. I'll do that. So he makes the decree and he signs it. And as soon as Daniel hears that this decree has been written, he goes back to his house and he goes to the upper room. That's as high as I can get. Nope, that's as high as I can get. And he bows down in front of the window and he praises God and he gives thanks to God in front of the window. And those satraps, prefects, governors, officials, counselors, they're spying on him. And they go, um, he's doing the thing that we wanted him to do. So they go straight back to the king and they say, oh, King Darius, how amazing you are. Didn't you just make a decree that no one could pray to any other god or king or man but you? Yes, I did. Well, your friend Daniel is doing that. Oh. 
Oh, I see. And in your decree, O king, didn't you say that um, whoever prayed to any other god, man or king, but you would be thrown in the lion's den? Yeah, I did. Huh. And he tried all night to try and think of a way to get Daniel off, but he couldn't. So he had Daniel arrested, and he was brought before him, and he said, Daniel, did you pray to any other god? Yeah. Right. So he threw him in a lion's den. And they rolled a stone in front of him, so he couldn't escape. He's in this den of lions, and he can't get out. And the king goes away, and he's distressed all night. He didn't eat, he didn't drink, he didn't have any entertainment for an entire night because he was so distressed. And he came back in the morning, he went, Daniel, are you still alive? Has your God saved you? Yep. Hey, king. I've been found blameless in the eyes of the Lord and in your eyes. So I'm still alive. So they wheeled the stone out of the way, and he came out. And Darius declared that in all his dominion, people should be awe, it should be in awe of Daniel's God. And he said, For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel faced persecution from the high officials, from the satraps, from the prefects, from the governors, from the councillors. They had hostility towards him because of the faith that he had. They tried to ensure that he died because of his faith. But yet Daniel remained firm. He continued to act in accordance with his faith even when he knew it could lead to a terribly painful end. But why? How did he have such courage? Do you think he felt blessed in that moment? Let's jump through the Bible towards the end to James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, which Russ read for us earlier. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing." Count it all joy when you face trials of various kinds. What? (laughs) I don't want to do that. This doesn't make any sense. I don't know about you, but I am a terrible baker. I find following the recipe and the instructions just incredibly stressful. And to me, this is a very insignificant but very real trial. And I can tell you now, there is no joy in the kitchen when I'm trying to bake. It's, it's a horrible place to be. So where on earth is this joy going to come from when the trials are even greater than me trying to bake? Do you think that Daniel had joy when he was thrown into the lion's den? When a Christian is tested, it shows that something's happening. Something is coming against that person because they're doing something good. They're doing something that's pleasing to God. And who is, who's doing this test? The devil. The one who wants Jesus' work to fail. So this joy, this blessing that we receive, is actually the knowledge that we are only facing trial because the devil is so unhappy that God is happy. Daniel had joy because he knew that Darius was starting to be aware of his faith and was taking an interest. This persecution that he faced was out of jealousy. He was achieving a good thing, and he was being tested because of it. And how did he end up? Blessed. His life was saved, and Darius decreed that in all his royal dominion, people should be in awe of the God of Daniel. So persecution can be found when we're evangelizing, when we're sharing the good news of Christ with those around us. And I believe that's a call for all of us. And if we turn to Mark 16, verses 14 to 20, it says this. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and the hardness of heart 
because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their bare hands. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the accompanying signs. So we have all been called, along with the disciples, to go into all nations to proclaim the love of God to everyone. To show people that there is freedom from their sins. Open Doors, a charity that aims to bring the gospel to unreached and challenging places, has a list of the top 50 most dangerous places to be a Christian right now. And they are, bear with me, North Korea, Somalia, Libya, Eritrea, Yemen, Nigeria, Pakistan, Sudan, Iran, Afghanistan, India, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Mali, Algeria, Iraq, Myanmar, Maldives, China, Burkina Faso, Laos, Cuba, Mauritania, Morocco, Uzbekistan, Niger, Central African Republic, Turkmenistan, Nicaragua, Oman, Ethiopia, Tunisia, Colombia, Vietnam, Bhutan, Mexico, Egypt, Mozambique, Qatar, the DRC, Indonesia, Cameroon, Brunei, Comoros, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Jordan, Malaysia, and Turkey in order, in theory. And these are the places where persecution is happening all the time. And it's very obvious to the people who are there. But I believe there's persecution in the UK as well, just on a much more minor scale. Everywhere around us, people are actively trying to stop Christianity. And we should feel blessed by this. Not because we want to feel attacked, but because we know that that means we're doing something right. We're facing persecution because we're stepping out in faith and following the Great Commission. So I have a challenge for everyone here today. We're already blessed. We're already living in the goodness of all these Beatitudes. By living in relationship with Jesus, we know that we are part of the kingdom of God. So with that in mind, where is your mission field? Where is your front line? Are you being called to share your faith with your family or your friends? Perhaps it's at work or a sports team. Maybe you're called to work in a church in the UK or for a Christian charity, or perhaps you're called to serve on mission overseas or somewhere else in the UK. Where is your front line? In all these scenarios, your actions may look different. It might be inviting someone to church or another church event, like a summer picnic. It could be very simply stating what you believe if they don't know that you're a Christian already. And it's truly amazing what kind of questions can come out from such a simple statement. Perhaps you're being called to live differently, to act according with the Bible in a scenario that's incredibly different to that. I remember when I was working on building sites, people would use language that was more often than not contradictory to the way the Bible says we should act. And so I tried to be as the Bible said. And people noticed and asked questions about that. And it was an odd place to be. But it was a way of evangelizing. Wherever we are called to serve, our reality will look very different. And it will take time and prayer to figure out what is right for you in your scenario for wherever you are called. And my principal, when I was at Bible college, once said to us, If you don't have any non-Christian friends, what are you doing? And those words have stuck with me ever since. If we're not living out the Great Commission, if we aren't living in the blessing of the Beatitudes, if we aren't allowing ourselves to be used for the furtherance of the kingdom of God, what are we doing? Jesus has made a new covenant. 
He has set us free so that we might be able to live in perfect unity with God. That we can be set free from all our sin. So let's join with him and use our lives to honor the blessing which which he has poured out on us. Let's not see this list of blessings as a backwards and upside down bunch of nonsense. But let's strive forward to see that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I'd love to end this preach with just a teeny bit of chaos. I did check with Craig, it's fine. Um, I think there's an opportunity here to pray, but I think there are different things that people are going to want to pray for. So if you're able to, I've set up, I haven't set up really, I've printed off four things and stuck them to the wall. Um, Different areas of the room in which we can pray. So in the back left, my back left, um, we've got an area where you can pray for those top 50 countries where it's most dangerous place to be a Christian. We can pray for them and the people who are trying to serve in mission in those areas. In the back right, I think it would be great if we could pray for our own front lines and pray for each other. To spend time seeking God in, in terms of who he's placed on our heart that we should be sharing this with and how best to approach that scenario. And then at the front here somewhere, I think it would be amazing if we could pray for those who might feel a call to mission further afield, whether that's abroad or just a shift in the UK. And I've asked Craig and Russ and Peter if they might be around to pray for you if you feel that is something that you're called to do. But let me end with this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Lord, I pray for all of us here that you would show us our mission fields, the areas that you want us to be present in and showing your love. Help us, God, to see the blessings that you pour out on us and be aware of your work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. Help us, Lord, to be thankful in our daily lives as we seek to serve you and follow you more closely. Amen. I encourage you to go and pray.